Great. You can see my slides and hear me, I assume. Seems like it's all working. Thanks for. <clears throat> yep, looks good. Cool. Thanks for cozying up this afternoon and um, coming to learn a little bit about tree fodder and some of the work we've been exploring on our farm and um, in our research. Um, so I'm going to give an overview today of a project we've been working on for the past couple of years um, on our farm around tree fodder, some of the ways that we're thinking about using it and some of the necessities that um, we found ourselves in with the changing climate that have brought tree fodder as a really important strategy. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about uh, both the nutritional uh, composition of some tree fodders that we studied, as well as a bit about carbon sequestration, how we're thinking about fitting trees into the landscape. So that's the, the main arc for uh, today. I'll share a bit more about the farm as we get into the presentation and feel free to pop questions in the chat um, at any point and I'll keep an eye. We'll also have some time at the end to, um, to answer some questions and, and have some conversation. Um, I wanna just uh, presence that we'll, we'll scratch the surface of some things and part of our project um, outreach component through our Sarah Farmer grant um, that Northeast Sarah was, was great to support. Um, is a whole kind of resource page on the Silva Pasture Book website. Uh, if you go to the silvapasturebook.com and click on tree fodder, you'll find that page that has a, some background um, copy and then uh, links to some other resources uh, relevant to, to the conversation. Um, this is also a place where I plan to post uh, the recording of this um, presentation today, so you can revisit that at a future time. But We've compiled a literature review, a resource library that's open source that you can check out if you want to dig into some of the research that's behind the work. Um, link to the grant report, which um, will be finalized in just a couple of weeks here, um, putting the finishing touches on that. And I'll talk about this seminar um, for a minute. On December, part of our project was to hold an outreach event, and we did a day-long tree fodder virtual uh, seminar, which um, featured some really awesome speakers talking about different aspects of tree fodder. And we posted all those recordings in a playlist to YouTube. And you can find that playlist again at the tree fodder uh, page on civilpasturebook.com. Really great um, information there uh, to, to mull over. And if you go to that book website at the top, I just want to present a couple of surveys that I'm, I'm involved with that we're looking for um, folks to complete. Um, one is um, in collaboration with um, a filmmaker, Costa Butsakaris, who recently uh, uh, filmed and produced um, Inhabitants. If you haven't seen that film, I highly recommend it. Um, him him and, and myself and uh, Regenerative Design Group is, is doing a civil pasture education project through the National Agroforestry Center. And part of that is we're trying to do an inventory of who's out there integrating trees, animals, and, and forages on, on farms or on landscapes in anywhere in the Northeast. So if you fall into that category on whatever scale and um, commitment, um, please visit the link that's on the webpage and fill that out. Um, additionally, if you're in New York State and have an interest in agroforestry as a whole, civil pasture being one of the several practices in agroforestry, there's a survey that we're administering through the Cornell University agroforestry team to learn about awareness and adoption of agroforestry. And that's really going to help us in the future to find priorities for education and research and, um, and get funding to support that. So uh, do fill those out, uh, take some time to do that. Um, and at the end of this, I'll, I'll also put a link in the chat for our mailing list if you want to get all these links and an email um, and, and hear from us as we do more education outreach events. So starting off, um, for me and, and my wife and son living on land, um, I appreciate that the conference has incorporated land acknowledgement. It's an important thing for us to also presence and, and, and hold as we think about land stewardship. Um, on our farm, and we're located on Guyancono or Cuga territory, which has never been ceded actually to what we now call the U.S. Um, it was unce it is unceded territory, and the Guyancono, as long as as well as the other um, nations in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, have sovereign right to um, to this land. And this is an ongoing issue that needs to be uh, addressed on multiple levels, uh, especially with the state in ways that we can support, uplift and, and honor the sovereignty of these of these nations. Um, and I've been fortunate to have some contact and relationship and learn some of the language um, through some folks in the Goyankono community. I'm grateful for that as it feeds into the into the work that we do. And as already mentioned was native land that uh, dot CA, which is a great growing open source map of of indigenous lands all over the all over the world now um, started in North America, but it's spread. So do check that out. 
And the reason I bring this up for, or one of many reasons I should say is, is when we talk about agroforestry, it's really important to presence from the beginning that agroforestry is a relatively new term coined in the 70s, um, but it describes a series of practices and approaches to land um, stewardship that are much older than that. And so there's, there's lots of folks um, practicing agroforestry who may not call it that or have other words uh, for that. And I don't wanna name those words because land stewardship or um, uh, land management or farming or homesteading, none of these things necessarily capture what, uh, what an indigenous uh, perspective and, and relationship to landscape might entail. And there's specific words in the different languages um, to describe that relationship that I don't know and I wanna honor um, that piece. And I've been fortunate to learn a lot of what I uh, know and come to understand from the forestry perspective from a local mentor, Mike DeMunn, who's part of the Seneca Nation and um, really brings a unique perspective to forestry. The forests he manages, you walk in and you do not know that um, timber harvests have happened there, um, amongst other things. So he leaves the forests better than he found them, supports wildlife health as, long, as well as the objectives for harvesting things from the woods. And so I appreciate and honor that indigenous wisdom as part of, of what we talk about when we say things like agroforestry. Additionally to that, um, when we think about the landscape that we're working with, I think it's um, easy to, to imagine a time when it was thickly covered in dense forest, because that's often the, the narrative that is perpetrated and, and shared in that um, indigenous communities that inhabited these lands for thousands of years were merely foraging or finding food in the landscape, but nothing could be further from the truth. There was a rich, dynamic, and deep history of stewardship and active engagement that really shaped the landscape in profound ways. This is a quote from a really excellent paper about what is called the pristine myth, which I recommend you check out. I do believe it's easy to find online. You can see the reference at the bottom there. And I just wanna read it because it really sets the context for what we're talking about. When we say something like agroforestry, we are talking about a, a land use pattern and, and sort of a spatial arrangement of plants and people that looks very similar to what was a, a pre-colonial um, version of what the landscape looked like. So. The forests of New England, the Midwest and the Southeast ha had been disturbed by varying degrees by indigenous activity prior to European occupation. Agricultural clearing and burning have converted much of the forest into successional growth and semi-permanent grassy openings often of considerable size. Much of the mature forest was characterized by, open, by an open herbaceous understory reflecting frequent ground fires. And that's from the pristine myth paper. It's also a wonderful book called Changes in the Land, which really documents this and, and how the attitudes and perceptions um, of indigenous communities as well as settler colonizers really shaped and affected the landscape in, in positive and negative ways over time. And an important element that we come to our, our work with thinking about agroforestry is really in relationship to things, um, in relationship to the living um, animated elements of the landscape that we're interacting with and, and orchestrating to some degree. And I really like this, this quote that defines some of the difference between sort of modern styles of thinking, Western styles of thinking that I think permeate a lot of what we do even in organic farming or sustainable farming or regenerative farming and really calls us to question the approach we take. Um, and so Stan Rushworth, who's an indigenous Cherokee elder says, we should consider the difference between a Western settler mindset of I have rights an indigenous mindset of I have an obligation. Instead of thinking I'm born with rights, I choose to think I was born with obligations to serve past, present, and future generations and the planet herself. And so this is really where we try to come at our work from. And as we've defined civil pasture for ourselves, there's lots of definitions out there. We, we've honed in on the, the pieces that are really important to us to think about when we think about why civil pasture, why integration of livestock, trees, and forage is on our landscape. So for us, we define it as ecological restoration for livestock habitat, because that really puts forward the two main goals we have. We wanna restore health of our ecological landscapes all the way down into the soil and all the way up to the treed landscape. And we wanna provide a really healthy, dynamic, diverse habitat for our livestock. And my background personally is in, is in forestry, forest ecology. And it's, it's interesting, I never thought about until I actually read um, some of the work of Fred Provenza who's another name to, to tuck away and look up some of, some of um, his work in collaboration with many others. Thinking about how to apply ecology to our livestock, we, we tend to um, 
objectify them a bit and not think of them in the same way that we might think about wild animals. And this word habitat has really helped us settle what we're trying to do um, with silvopasture. So this is a habitat for livestock. And this is the most common habitat that modern agriculture has provided for livestock. And, and certainly um, we could talk at length about the, the, the negative consequences of this on many levels, but um, not a habitat that I think we could say is a space where their curiosity, uh, their natural um, instincts, um, or the, the sort of features of the landscape are honored in any, in any sense of the way. When I walk into a farm like this, this is Angus Glen Farm, my, my friend and Oh, Steve, I think we lost your audio. How's that? That is much better, thank okay, you. Okay, sorry. I think I hit my little, uh, my little button there. I'm gonna move that out of the way. So um, this is Brett Chedzoy's farm, Angus Glen, that he stewards with his wife, Maria, and family, where they're uh, ranging Black Angus cattle in civil pasture systems on hundreds of acres. Um, and so uh, I think the beauty of this landscape, as well as the functionality, both for the animals, for the trees, and for the habitat it creates, is really a testament to the sort of things we're looking at. And this is about a 30-year-old civil pasture um, plantation. And um, on our own farm, we think about this with our sheep, smaller ruminants that we work into the landscape in, in a number of different ways, where we're adding trees and creating these little microhabitats where as we move them and rotate them around the farm, which we, we tend to do every day or every couple of days um, throughout the gra grazing season, um, they're encountering something different, something new, something unique that feeds not only just sort of a nutritional baseline, but also um, what I believe is their curiosity and natural instincts to to forage and, and seek out food and balance their own diet. And so, um, and so we're grateful for, for the opportunity to do that and to be in a relationship to, to provide that um, in exchange for the things they provide to us. Silva pasture uh, in its strict definition kind of comes at land use from two different uh, directions, depending on what you're starting with. So you could have a, a piece of land dominated by woody vegetation and we call that woodland conversion when we're opening up the canopy and the understory to allow enough light in to, to produce forages in the understory intentionally. We could also put trees into pasture and over time create that overstory, um, whether that's in uh, this orchard type setting, you see in the picture, rows of trees, um, any kind of uh, spatial arrangement that can provide um, more, more diversity, provide shade and shelter for the animals in particular. So for us, shade and shelter and fodder have become the real main motivating things to bring silver pasture into our farm. And so I just want to contrast that with what we see as a lot of ways that woodlands have been used in the recent uh, history, which is to toss animals in them at convenient times and, and not really worry too much about the forage in the understory. Um, and, um, and any animal can do uh, incredible positive good for the landscape and, and incredible positive harm. And it doesn't take long for the, the, the pendulum to switch from one of those to the other. So it's not just putting an animal into the woods. It is an intentional system where we're cultivating forages. And we're giving those landscapes um, a rest period in addition to the time when the animals are in there so that they can recover sufficiently so that the next time the animals come in, they're only doing good things. Um, so that's an important thing to mention. So we know the climate's changing. And for us, Civil Pasture offers an incredible set of solutions that simultaneously address the need to capture more carbon in our ecosystems and build farm resilience at the same time. Because even if we flip the switch and we're doing a much better job of reducing our emissions and, and therefore the impacts of a changing climate, we st we're still gonna feel those and we are feeling them. And certainly the, the 10 years that we've been on this piece of land, the, the 20 years that we farmed on other, uh, in other projects in various places, we've seen the effects that we're living and feeling those effects. And, um, and we don't know exactly what they're gonna look like. So what are we gonna create in the future as far as a sustainable habitat? Um, without diving too deep into the, the science and the, the, ch the challenging conversations that are happening, there's a lot of ways that livestock are often blamed for carbon emissions, um, specifically um, carbon, I should say, and methane. Um, and um, these are often in the context of those confinement habitats, like I showed in the previous slide. Um, there's also some controversy and complications with just a managed grazing system. Um, and it's not to say that any one system works exactly perfectly in any uh, situation. We have to think of context appropriate solutions. Um, but this NPR article is actually a really good kind of primer on grass-fed beef and grazing and, and where that sits in the argument. 
Um, but the the certainly the managed grazing, which means just improving grazing, not having continuous access of animals to landscape, does have some evidence that it can be net positive in terms of um, its carbon footprint. And so this is an example of a farm in Georgia doing um, rotational grazing on a large scale that did an extensive catalog of its carbon footprint and the life cycle and did find that the um, there was more carbon being stored than spent um, in the life cycle of, of the, the beef enterprise. And so there's one example there, but the examples get really complicated when you start to look at other parts of the world, especially brittle environments, um, different soil compositions, things like that. So the beauty of civil pasture is when we take a managed grazing system where we can um, move animals through and rapidly accelerate carbon storage in the soil because we're um, clipping grasses, sloughing roots off into the soil and building that carbon up. If we couple that with trees, it basically is a game changer. It basically is in, in almost every scenario, a net positive um, carbon scenario. So, when, so if we wanna have an argument all day about grazing, we could do that. And sometimes yes, sometimes no, it's good for carbon. When we add trees, we're kind of always in the, um, in, the red, uh, in, the, in the black, so to speak, I guess, <laughs> if we use that analogy, right? So the beauty of the, the grasses and is they have a rapid uh, mechanism to put so, uh, carbon into the soil. When we add trees, we have another layer of um, complex organic materials added to the soil, as well as the above ground biomass, which contributes to a, a, another longer term store of carbon. And uh, mixed into this, when we talk about soil and carbon, what we're actually really also talking about is fungal communities and fungal networks. And um, more and more is just being learned, it seems like every week and every month about the role fungi play. And what's key to know is that grassland ecosystems are low in fungal communities. Once you add trees, you start to rapidly increase the presence and the dynamics of fungal communities and so therefore likely increase the, the carbon sequestration potential. So trees bring the fungi and fungi bring the carbon essentially from a soil health perspective. So they're a member of this. When we talk about grasses, we talk about trees, we have to also honor the fungi as part of that. And we have to honor the grazing animals because without them chewing, uh, uh, digesting, and then depositing fertility back into the landscape, we wouldn't have the potential for this rapid cycling of uh, of nutrients, of water, and of carbon uh, back into the system. So the short end of it is if we want to see our, our grazing landscape sequester more carbon, what we can do in the short term is build up the soil carbon as much as possible. And our farm has seen in 10 years, um, some of our carbon percentages go from four, four and a half percent to six or six and a half percent um, just through managed grazing and, and the adding of trees. Um, and, and, and then we can add the trees as a sort of a secondary. So at some point, the around six, 7%, the carbon stocks and soils can start to get oversaturated. There's not a lot of room for more carbon. And that's where the trees really can take over and provide a longer term service in terms of that carbon sequestration. So there's a wonderful project called Drawdown, which ranks a number of different solutions to think about reducing carbon emissions. Civil pasture really shows up in, um, there's about a hundred solutions that were ranked and civil pasture is one of the top solutions and is by far the top land use based decision. Um, and, and that's based on research globally of this practice. And so that's a great resource. This is a diagram created by a friend, Eric Tonsmeyer, who helped author the agroforestry section of Drawdown showing civil pasture and how it ranks. So if you look at this, we have a number of different land use practices on the left side with the tons per hectare of carbon sequestration potential on the bottom of this graph. And so dots that are further to the right are gonna sequester more carbon. A lot of our regenerative agriculture and carbon practices are focused in the bottom left corner there, improved grazing, conservation agriculture, low-till, low no-till, improving annual cropping systems. And those are important uh, pieces to, to address and to work with. But when we really look at large global change and where we're going to be able to sequester carbon, you really start to see the systems where trees show up as having the most impact. And so silver pasture really shows up there. Above civil pasture are small perennial based systems, um, tropical home gardens and uh, traditional indigenous home garden systems, multi-strata ecosystems with um, fruit and nut producing trees and things like that certainly have a role, but probably don't have the um, acreage um, to be able to address this on a larger scale. So it's not to say that civil pasture is the solution, but it's, it's, it's a nested in all of these as really important components. And what we find through research is that it really depends. So these are carbon stock, uh, this is carbon stock data from multiple um, sites um, with, with silver pasture systems. Um, and you can see quite, quite a bit of variability in what the capacity of a, a given site is. So for instance, 
if you have a, a soil that is heavy in clay, um, you have a, a, a better potential in actually sequestering carbon than a site that has a, a lower clay content. And, and that's really just based on the composition of the soil and what it can do in terms of holding carbon, um, not just sequestering, but actually holding it for the long term and cycling it in those systems. So there's a lot of variability and it's, it's just key to keep that in mind that um, we don't want any one size fits all solutions as we go through this. If you want to dig more into the carbon uh, calculations and budgeting. This is a great little article through the Association for Temperate Agroforestry that you can find and, and read up a bit more on the math if that interests you. But that's just some context. When we bring it down to the farm and personal level, what we've been working on is, and this is both work on, on my farm and, and through Cornell, um, is to start to look at the potential for tree planting on farms and what it can do for carbon. So this is some really conservative data, actually. It's, old, it's, it's an old data set, but it's a good data set because it provides a good baseline. And, and what it really shows is that we have um, a small amount of carbon being sequestered as the trees are young, but as they grow, sort of an exponential growth in the potential annual and also cumulative storages of carbon. So if we play this out over time, this is uh, two charts showing what it would look like to plant 10 trees, 100 trees, or 1,000 trees. So on an annual basis or on a cumulative basis, meaning over that 20 years total, how much carbon are we sequestering? Well, with a thousand trees, um, about 192 tons of carbon sequestered over the 20 years of those trees being planted. Um, on an annual basis, those thousand trees will sequester about 18 and a half tons of carbon, right? So we're working with some of these numbers to think about how this can be useful as a tool as farmers think about planting trees on their farms and doing some of that math because it, it's linked to a growing interest in potentially funding these types of projects and supporting farmers to do this work. And um, that's a whole nother, nother talk I can share a bit on, but it's exciting stuff that um, is happening within, um, within the Cornell agroforestry community. So, you know, as I think about this as an individual farmer, one thing I was interested in is, is well, what do we actually as a family um, uh, emit. So we use one of these carbon footprint calculators. There's a lot of nuanced uh, challenges with them, but uh, this one, at least I felt pretty good about it. It said we, we emit about 12, 12, 12 and a quarter tons a year. Um, I just want to point out though, I love these things are always like, oh, by the way, you could just pay $47 and offset that if you want. Um, this is not a realistic um, number of value to put on what it takes to plant, maintain, and um, ensure that these trees are surviving and thriving. 787 trees is what this calculator says I need in order to offset, um, but it certainly costs more than $47 to, <laughs> to see those trees through to a meaningful carbon sequestration lifestyle. So when I think about stewarding on our farm, if we planted a thousand trees, um, this year, you know, over, over the next few years, um, in the, it, it, by year 14 or 15, we'd start to see an annual return that actually matches our carbon budget, which I think is an interesting number to keep in the back of my head. We plant maybe 100 to 300 trees a year, um, um, and we'd like to bump that up. And that's, that's the stuff we're kind of thinking about is what it would take for a farm to, to bump those things up and, and work with that. And so we can do some math with it. We can assume that some of the trees are going to die. They're not going to thrive. Um, we did an assessment of a, a small plot of our land, which is actually more of a mixed um, garden, orchard, kind of uh, some, some hedgerows of trees, um, and found that this, this small little area of just over half an acre um, is, is sequestering a ton and a half of carbon a year, which is pretty good. Um, so these kind of tools are things we're thinking about. And it's certainly one of the motivators, but the main motivator in this context is to talk to folks in policy, talk to folks in the um, investment world about ways that we can support trees on farms and support the farmers who want to steward those trees, because I think that's a really important way. We're far, far beyond the time when it's, we need to be putting trees in the landscape. And I think farmers hold a really good potential um, for that uh, as, as stewards of it. A lot of tree planting projects have failed because they're set up as these operations where trees go in, kind of they're kind of thrown at the ground and then people walk away and they never take care of them. And I think farmers have a unique um, vested interest, especially if we can partner those trees with um, their management goals um, to take care of those trees and see them through. And that, that's better for all of us. Um, so that's the carbon piece of this. Now our farm has that interest and is, is really considering the role trees play, but also we have a sort of practical day-to-day -day reality and, and carbon is not the thing I get up in the morning and think about. I'm, I'm thinking about where are the sheep and how are they going to be fed and do we have any issues and what do we need to do for the day? Um, so trees do provide that kind of day-to-day -day service as well. Um, our farm is really oriented around the idea of, of farming in the image of a forest. So we we seek to um, steward the forest where the, the trees are there and where they're not try to reforest. And our hope is that 
when we're on the no, no longer on the land that a forest is left behind, as well as a really healthy fertile soil versus the degraded soil, compacted soil, the um, the landscape cleared of trees, these kind of things that we found and many of us find on farms that we might um, land on at some point in our journey. So our farm does a lot of diversified production. Um, our main crop is actually mushrooms, gourmet mushrooms that we produce indoors and out. Um, we do some maple syrup. We do our lamb, of course. Um, we are ever growing a tree nursery. We've been doing, growing a lot of trees for ourselves, but are, are starting to sell some trees. And we do a lot of education and agritourism as well. We pre-pandemic used to host a lot of workshops. A lot of those look a bit virtual now, but we're hoping to restart some stuff on the land this year. Um, and we have agritourism through some rentals. We have a, a yurt and a cabin that we, we rent. And it's a nice way to welcome people on the land that may not directly be related to agriculture, but get exposed to it by, by spending time at the farm. And we steward about 45 acres. Half of this is rented and half we, we have title to. Um, and this is our paddock system. Uh, the green areas are, are conservation areas that we're not um, actively grazing and we're doing some sort of wildlife or water management in there. Um, the blue paddock system is our winter paddock system where the animals spend time when they're not grazing. Um, it's a nice wooded sheltered area. We call it a living barn. Uh, it's a term I got from Brett Chedzoy um, to describe a space where we create a really nice habitat for winter for our grazing animals. And then the red boxes are where we rotate our animals um, during the grazing season. And you can see some of them are open pasture and some of them are woods. And so the long-term, you know, 10 to 20 year uh, project is to convert all of these to civil pasture one way or the other. Um, and it's not something that happens overnight. It takes time. Um, we've made some strides, but we have a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot more strides to take, I guess. Uh, so um, also on the Civil Pasture book site, if you wanna take a little virtual tour of our farm, we have this cool little Google Earth map that I made for a workshop that you can find on the resource page at civilpasturebook.com. And each of these little pins has a video or some pictures and describes some of the practices that we're um, engaged with and some of the lessons we've learned about even the things that haven't worked um, on the landscape. And so you can check those out if you want to really dig into some of the, the minute little corners of the landscape and the types of projects we're doing. But I want to return to tree fodder and just sort of give it in some context. So I mentioned the kind of day-to-day -day need. Um, carbon sequestration is great and all, but the reality of hitting farms in our farm is, is, the, is the reality of the unknown, which farmers have been used to since, since farming was farming. Um, but is becoming increasingly um, unpredictable. And so when we think about a grazing system, the biggest thing is excessive drought or excessive dry times or excessive rainfall, both which inhibit the uh, growth and regrowth of grasses and, and legumes, the traditional foods that we're feeding our animals. And 2016 was a real um, wake up call for us. Um, our, uh, let's see, our county, we're sort of right on the line of Tompkins and Schuyler County. So we're kind of right at the bottom right corner of this little red blob, which was one of the driest ever recorded seasons on record in 2016. And we did our first rotation around the farm and literally came back around and had nothing to feed the animals and kind of had this moment where, oh, good thing we have that grazing plan because we assumed that meant the grass would grow and it is not. <laughs> um, but a quick assessment on Google Earth made us realize that all these edges and fringe areas that were on the land that we hadn't brought the animals in contact with were actually about 20% of our total land um, and were areas that were thickly overgrown and kind of neglected by the previous farmers, basically the spaces where they had not, you know, mowed or plowed or done anything and they just become these kind of overgrown thickets. And we saw the opportunity in this and, and we're lucky to have a breed of sheep that was um, pretty game to uh, make use of, uh, make, make lemons out of lemon or make lemonade out of lemons, I guess. So we uh, switched our plan that year and really fenced them into a lot of these hedgerows and let them have it at it really out of desperation, just trying to give them access to things that were green um, and not really sure what was going on and kind of scared that they were going to eat something that, you know, was going to make them sick or something like that. We'd read all the things about wild cherry and um, raspberry and all the milkweed and all these things that could potentially cause problems. Um, turns out they don't read the books and they have an incredible ability to <laughs> um, step into the landscape and, and self-regulate if, if they have experience doing that within their community. Um, if they were in confinement their whole life and no one taught them what that looks like, um, they may not have that same uh, ability, but um, our sheep are katahdins and they, they are sort of like goat sheep in the sense that they, they can consume woody browse almost as happily as anything in the pasture. So it was a really interesting year and we realized we kind of lucked out because we didn't have to buy in extra hay. 
Um, we saw our friends up the road having to do that and, and things like that. And we're able to sustain them for um, about 45 days on, on this woody vegetation. And our management switched from rotational grazing to getting out there with chainsaws and loppers and, and handsaws and cutting stuff for them. And I really enjoyed that work and the animals enjoyed being in that space. It was a very hot year and it was, it was a moment when things clicked and we said, okay, well, next time we really need to be prepared for this kind of scenario where there's no forage and we need something to feed the animals. Simultaneously, when we started, this was about five years into the halfway through our farm development. We, when we first got there, there were a lot of water management issues that we were keen of and interested in addressing. And one of the things we did is install um, several hundred feet of swales to capture excessive rain um, and hold it and allow, allow it to soak into the landscape. And um, at that time, we recognized that when we did this kind of earth moving, and you can see here, this is the berm where these willow stakes are planted and you have the basin um, upslope from it, where, which would catch the water. It's a lot of soil disturbance and we wanted to make sure to revegetate that. And at that time, cheap was the name of the game. And we just found that we could find this material for free, essentially. It took some time to harvest it, but very inexpensive way to establish trees, basically cut a stake and stick it in the ground. And I wish all trees were that easy. Um, Willow and poplar and some of the other ones that we like to play with uh, do have that uh, propensity, which is really nice. It may, means we can establish trees very affordably. So this has already been happening. And by the time this drought hit, um, here's a, a picture of us finishing the, the swale just to get a sense of the, the basin. Pretty, pretty large system there. Here's it after a four inch rainfall. Um, and this water used to run off our slopes and do a lot of gulling and erosion. But this coupled with the rotational grazing has drastically increased the water holding capacity of our landscape. And so we don't see this water causing problems. It is now feeding the landscape and, and able to handle that. So it was a really nice uh, turnaround a couple of years after we got these established to see some of those benefits really quickly. And we, we continue to see those. This was an incredibly wet year um, in our part of New York and the swales were a really beneficial piece. So all the while the willows are growing up and they're doing this thing and they're, they're five years old by the time we, we hit this incredibly scary uh, drought. And um, we realized that, uh, you know, the willow is green and we are going to give the animals anything green. That was kind of our mode. Uh, what we noticed with the willow is that they would eat it for a while and then they kind of back off. It wasn't something they would consume all day. And this was before we understood the concept of secondary compounds in um, forages, um, especially uh, tannins, which are really prevalent in willow. And what's really interesting is that um, condensed tannins, in, especially uh, in willow, have been shown to both reduce parasite loads in animals, have been shown to slow down their digestion and help them digest other woodier tough stuff, and also been shown to reduce methane um, in grazing animals because it slows down the, the process in the rumen. So those tannins are actually a really important beneficial compound. What it means though is that um, because of those compounds are harder to digest, it slows them down and they need other things to supplement. And so we saw that in the landscape before we saw it in the research and, and, and now realize this is, a, this is a medicinal feed bank <laughs> for our sheep. It is not the mainstay of their diet, but is an important supplement. And so this is where the wheels started to turn and say, okay, it's not just the stuff that's on the edges that we can feed our animals. It's also the things we plant. And if we understand how these plants work, we could really be feeding them strategically at the right times and, and really enhancing their health and, and enjoyment of the landscape. Because I think there's nothing more enjoyable for a, a, especially a sheep or a goat than to be stripping, stripping vegetation. Um, in 2019, we actually had a hedge lane workshop. If you're not familiar with hedge lane, you should Google it and check out some of the images. This is a traditional method of building living fences, um, still remnant in parts of the UK and Europe and really around the world, but hedge lane and some of the techniques I learned, I learned in the UK. So we had a workshop and we, we cut down all this vegetation and turned it into this, um, this living fence, which is great. I don't have to put any portable fence up now. And it's now a medicinal uh, fence <laughs> that they can graze on when they move through these systems. Um, and what we also realized is by coppicing and laying these trees down and weaving them into a fence, we were creating re-sprout growth, which is much more palatable and more nutritious and a much better way to manage this vegetation um, uh, with, with the animals uh, being able to graze on and access it easier. So I really see this as a, a traditional and ancestral land use practice that has multiple benefits, not only being a fencing, but also a, a feed bank, a fodder bank for these animals. And so we're constantly kind of thinking about these things and the willow just keeps teaching us um, over time of how this can happen. And it's not just for the animals too, they, they, they'll eat a, a certain amount of this, but again, we move them every day. And so there's plenty of willow left and there's plenty of material here to 
weave into baskets to um, harvest and use uh, as a tincture. It's, it was the first aspirin was um, sal uh, sal salicylic acid from willow. Um, so it can be really good for pain management and things like that. So there's lots of uses. Willow is this incredible tree that I think is often overlooked. And this purple osier willow that we grew, one of the beautiful things is, is its flowering um, in the spring, which is really important pollinator source. It's one of the first and most abundant trees to provide a pollen source to those early season pollinators. So the, the benefits just keep stacking up. And as we learn more and think more, um, we're just blown away by, by willow and other trees. But just to give you an example, we won't go into all of these with all the trees that we've been working with. But this is a um, buffer that was planted on Prince Edward Island that I visited during an agroforestry conference that was designed to harvest excess phosphorus and nitrogen runoff. And they found that this willow could harvest about 95 to 100% of the runoff and utilize it as a fertilizer to uh, rapidly increase its growth. And so these groves were being harvested on a rotation and actually chipped as biomass and used as an energy source for the farm. Beautiful cyclical piece there. We could also harvest this material and feed its animals, of course. So willow buffers are now a conservation um, measure on the landscape that's also sequestering carbon because these rapidly growing trees are putting a lot of carbon into the soil and into their biomass and also a potential food and medicine source for livestock. And these are the kind of stacking benefits that we're really looking to, to make happen more on our farm. So tree fodder, um, that's our benefit is, is really nutrition and also some medicine. This is our sheep snacking. Our annual practice now is to throw our Christmas tree to our sheep and it's a nice little way for them to um, have a green something to eat during the hay season. Um, but we also see it as a real important measure if we put the trees in the right place to, to have some resilience to, to, as I mentioned, excessive dry and drought and, and flooding type conditions. As we talk about fodder, I want to mention that as you look through literature and read through things, you might find a lot of different words, and it doesn't always mean woody material. What I'm talking about when I say tree fodder is mainly the leaf material, maybe some twigs and stems and buds, but mostly the leaf material of woody plants. But fodder, generally speaking, if you look it up in the dictionary, means almost anything you could feed to animals. And I've seen the words fodder and forage and browse used interchangeably, sometimes for grasses and legumes, sometimes just for woody stuff and all over and in between. Um, when we say the word mast, what we mean is the potential to feed animals something that falls from a tree that um, is generally either like a fruit or a nut. Soft mast being the fruits and hard mast being the nuts. So just keep those words in mind. I'm going to talk about tree fodder, but if you look for fodder, you might find a lot of different ways it's used um, out there. And over the course of this grant, we recognize some challenges to fodder. We had a lot of questions, a lot of excitement around this concept. But if we actually think about managing the system, there are a lot of questions about what is even in them nutritional wise it, when is it good or not good to feed them how often can we graze them and you know they don't have the same recovery period we know as grasses and legumes so what is an appropriate rest period before we expose them to animals again how do we manage them for increasing the amount of forage like coppicing or cutting them like i mentioned with the the, the, the willow fence and all these kind of things as well as you know concerns with toxicity which i'll, I'll touch on but I have to say, broadly speaking, um, I have less and less concerns with toxicity over time as I learn more about and, and have a, a, a flock of animals who have an intelligence and a relationship to the landscape. When I wrote the Civil Pasture book, I really wanted to see who had done the research and who had, what tree species had really well-established sort of credentials as tree fodder. And so I started with a much bigger list, but really came to land on these four species as really appropriate for the sort of temperate cold climate and, and each kind of offering something really be, uh, beneficial in their own right, but having some history as research with fodder, um, being adaptable and fast growing, easy to propagate and having some secondary products. Um, and all of these are trees that also show up on carbon lists because they're fast growing, which means they're rapid carbon sequestration tools as well. So again, those win-win kind of benefits. Benefits. Interestingly enough, willow and poplar are very similar to grasses in composition. Um, poplar has a very balanced nutrition. Willow, the difference being having those tannins, which can um, limit the intake, but again, also serve as a really medicinal um, component to an animal's diet. Um, black locust is very analogous to like an alfalfa, very high protein feed, so really valuable in that regard. And mulberry, um, uh, is actually probably the, the most traditional fodder plant used around the world for animals and has incredible digestibility, has the uh, incredible 
mineral nutrient density, and also has the fruit, of course, which can be a food. And so its high digestibility has allowed it to even be used as a fodder for animals who don't have a ruminant, uh, a rumen, um, like pigs and poultry. Um, so those are the, the, the species I found. Now, we hadn't done a lot of mulberry establishments. So when it came time to do the grant, that was not one that we were able to study. But just to show you some pictures of, of our establishment, here's some locusts that we're planting, close spacing about a meter apart or three feet. This is in 2013. By 2017, they were over 30 feet tall. Um, they're nitrogen fixing trees, again, high protein, high, um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Yeah, the, the high, cr high crude protein amounts, um, some, some nutrients, but I'd say the protein uh, being the, the big one. So it's really the tree legume. And if you're not in a climate that could support black locusts, you could find an, uh, an analog tree that is a legume that kind of fills that role. Um, but we planted this once, you know, alfalfa, you got to plant every three or four years uh, and replow and things like that. We're planting this once and now this is a, a fodder bank as well as a place to grow rot resistant fence posts because the wood is incredibly rot resistant or even building materials if we want to wait long enough. Um, and if we think about a carbon sequestration perspective, well, if I harvest that pole and then I put it into a building, that's, that's a form of sequestration, right? And um, the old farm saying is that um, if you use a black locust for a fence post, the way you know it's time to replace that fence post is you put a rock on top of the fence post, and when the rock decomposes, it's time to replace the locust. So <laughs> um, it's really rot resistant. Uh, when I put a locust post in the ground or when we use it in a building, I, I'm, I'm always thinking, well, it's probably going to be here longer than I am, um, in all honesty. So, so really rapid growth, great products. One, one warning I will say is once those trees get established, they're real uh, do a lot of root suckering. So they want to create a thicket of locusts, which you can manage. And now you don't have to replant um, is one advantage, but folks get scared of this. And sometimes locust is, is demonized as quote unquote invasive um, because it does such a good job of creating these thickets. But what we found is a really well-managed grazing system really helps keep this in check because the animals do the pruning of the, the sprouts back to the ground. And it's not a problem. And it's just giving them more access to this high protein forage. So, um, but I don't recommend it often for folks who, who aren't using grazing animals, because um, if you're not willing to get in there and do the hand management, then you might have a thicket in, in a place you don't want. So be, be aware if you plant black locusts of where it is and what edges are around it and, um, and, and make sure you don't wanna have an issue with spread. We found over time, we, we started off with a very close spacing. We, we realized really quickly that planting in rows made a lot of sense. So at the bottom of this picture is the willow um, planting that I showed you the stakes of um, that's along the swale. And then the locust that I just showed you a picture of on the top of the slope there. And this is about, there's about 45 or 50 feet between these rows. We started off, we, we were planting trees 30 feet apart. And we realized that's a really awkward uh, from a grazing perspective because getting those, that, that fencing in there and having those narrow shoots is just not what the animals want to work with. So, so recommendations right now are sort of in the 30 would be the minimum, but I would say closer to 50 or 60 feet for sheep and small ruminants and more like 80 or 100 feet for cattle, at least to start. You could always fill in trees in the future. But I think rows at wide spacing is a really good strategy. Uh, we lost a lot of trees because we let the animals eat them because we just realized it was too hard to manage these really tightly knit rows um, in the short term. So, so keep that in mind if you think about getting trees established is start wide and, and fill in the space later because that's something we learned. And part of tree planting is definitely that some will die and some you'll have to let go of. Um, that's part of the game, but um, hopefully I can pass that on and it won't, <laughs> won't translate to everyone else. Um, the other ways that we, we found our animals continuously interacting with our landscape is through the, the so-called um, management of, again, invasives. I don't like that word because I think the plants um, showed up because of the humans and, um, and it, it, it projects uh, some sort of, uh, uh, <laughs> some sort of like uh, intent that these plants have to do harm and, and, I, and, and sort of the language around it's really troubling to me. But um, the plants are here and um, our animals love them. They don't read the books. They don't say, well, that, that plant is a good plant. That plant's a bad plant. So I'm only going to eat the good ones. They'll eat anything. And so we've been using our animals a lot for vegetation control. And we were curious to know if these uh, plants that they seem to really love consuming had any nutritional value. Where did they stack up against some of the more common fodder plants that I mentioned before? And does it make sense to manage the spread of these? This is European buckthorn, another um, tree people love to hate but um, a tree that the sheep love to eat and uh, that holds its green leaf material really late into the season and um, can be really easily managed. This is a pollard where we're cutting the tree 
off at um, above browse height. So this is a storage of emergency fodder for that next drought season. And we're um, con concentrating and controlling sort of um, the vegetation in a way that works for us as managers and making it really easy for us to harvest this for the sheep next time we need it. Um, so we were curious about the nutrition of these things and how they could fit in. So we wrote a grant to the, the SARE, uh, Northeast SARE Farmer Grant Program, which I highly recommend. It's a really wonderful um, opportunity. The grants usually are uh, due at the end of each year um, and you can do like a one to three year project, a research project that'll benefit you and, and that you can share the results with others. So our focus was to do some collection of tree forage for six different species on the farm, three that we planted and three that we found sort of um, naturalized and see how they stacked up. Just learn about them, learn about if um, what their base nutrition was and also learn how that might change over the course of the, of the season. Um, so I'll share the results of that because I'm finally done. It's a lot of, a lot of graphing and, and data crunching over the, over the last uh, few weeks here. So we chose these six. Again, we didn't have a lot of mulberry on the property, but I would love to, we're, we are establishing more of that because I think it has real promise. And if you listen to our tree fodder webinar, um, Eliza Greenman talks at length and is a real proponent of the mulberry. And um, I'm certainly interested to learn more about that as we work it. But we had these three, willow, poplar, and black locust, well-established. And we also had a, a high presence of Japanese honeysuckle, European buckthorn, and wild cherry, which are three species that people love to cringe at. And so I wanted to see how they stacked up. And wild cherry in particular was one that people say, well, your animals shouldn't eat that. It's toxic. But um, there's a lot of nuance to that. And actually in small doses and in the right context, it's not toxic and they actually love to eat it. So I was curious to see what was in there. So we selected randomly from multiple different trees. We wanted to get a random sampling and kind of mix it together. That's the recommendation is you aggregate from multiple trees so you don't get a, a biased sample. Just like when you do soil testing, you take from multiple sites and mix it together. So we did that from around the farm and we basically did um, eight collections in year one and 12 collections in year two. So we did a total of 20 samples, which is why I'm grateful for the grant funding because there's no way out of pocket we could we could do that many, um, six trees, 20 times, that's 120 samples. If you do the math, it's quite a bit of money just to do the testing. We were blessed in a sense that um, in 2019, it was a, uh, relatively wet and cooler, wetter than normal um, and, and cooler than normal on average. And, and 2020 was um, drier than normal, not drought, but abnormally dry and warmer than normal. And so we kind of got to a bit on the extreme, not crazy, um, not as crazy as some of the other years we've seen, but gave us some different perspective, which I appreciate. Um, and so here are some of the, the results. And the, the summary I can say is that all of them offer really great nutrition. Um, in particular, black locust and buckthorn have a lot of protein um, that they sustain throughout the season. Um, so really good source of those. Um, other plants, uh, other trees though, have really decent amounts of protein that are, are at least as good as grass, so, but that's not probably what we target is, is a protein in these other ones. But good ADF and NDF, if you're not familiar, are, are different measures of digestibility. Um, ADF sort of relates to the energy in that feed and, and NDF relates to uh, the lignans and the woody stuff that tends to fill up the rumen. And so the lower those numbers, the better. And, and uh, the summary is that those numbers compare really well to your common uh, pasture forage is some better than others, so they're quite digestible. Um, and they have a really good relative feed value, which is a way to calculate the sort of total um, value of this. Um, alfalfa is usually the, the, the benchmark at 100, and so anything above 100 has an exceptional feed value. And so you, you see these plants really having quite the, quite the, the numbers posted here um, from that perspective. Um, when we looked at macronutrients and micronutrients, what we found is some species really excelled at accumulating different nutrients. So buckthorn, honeysuckle, wild cherry, really exceptional numbers for calcium um, versus like honeysuckle and willow for magnesium and buckthorn really excelled at potassium. Um, but even, even the, the, uh, some of the other ones that I didn't circle here still have really good amounts. And so it's clear that these plants can offer um, some substantial nutrient comp uh, contributions to the diet where some of the pasture legumes and grasses may be more deficient. Um, the numbers at the bottom, by the way, we took from the Dairy One forage database. This was a cumulative sample of all the forage analysis um, in New York for 10 years. And so those give you some averages to compare to. Micronutrients would be a, another thing we looked at. Again, some of them like um, poplar and willow, interestingly, really, really high amounts of zinc showing up in their samples. Honeysuckle, mollybenum, um, wild cherry and willow, uh, manganese. Um, 
And as we dug in and we said, okay, well, these are interesting things. How do these numbers compare? It's not always necessarily that bigger is better. And actually, if the numbers are really high, it could be a concern with uh, hyperaccumulation and toxicity. Um, but we found that uh, almost all of these are falling within normal ranges of acceptable. And, um, and it just comes down to a case by case scenario if it's important for you to target for these different nutrients. But what we see overall is these forages are incredibly uh, nutritious and have a lot to offer in terms of the, the nutrients they, they show up with. And so this slide kind of summarizes some of the things that they, they really excel at as we look at these different species. And what's important to note is that it's not like just one of them, you know, is the one. They all have something different to bring to the table. Um, wild cherry, you know, we did the analysis there and have, has some benefit. It wasn't particularly um, um, striking in any of these and it was, was less digestible than some of the others. So it wasn't like a, a, a big one, but, but the honeysuckle and buckthorn really, really sort of held their own. I feel like they really showed that they have value from that nutrition standpoint. Um, and it's not that I'm going to suggest that you go out and plant these things, but I bet they're in your landscape. And if they are, maybe we think about managing them and not just eradicating them because they are uh, the, the least, they're, they're probably the most cost-effective way to increase palatable tree fodder in your landscape is to manage existing vegetation versus always planting stuff that's new. Um, so initially on our farm, we thought, well, we're gonna rip this stuff out and, and plant willow and poplar. But now I'm saying, well, let's manage some of this because there's only so many hours in a day and that's, that's gonna be more of the, the reality. When it looked, when it came to time to like track seasonal trends and like if things change or if there's any sort of like this decreases over the season, this um, this diminishes over the season, when might be an ideal time to feed this? Does it matter? Uh, the basically the results were it, it, it the data sort of all over the place. There's not for most of these you can see a couple exceptions a real strong correlation between the data and a trend. Um, one exception would be like black locust had um, definitely diminished crude protein content over the course of the summer. And that was that was pretty well correlated. And I'll show a few of those graphs, but these are showing for the kind of main markers of palatability in a feed, feed result. Um, it was similar for the micronutrients. So there, there's not like a, a substantial, OK, this is the window to feed this thing. They all kind of hold their own. If you're interested in targeting a specific thing, you, you don't have to worry, at least from this data, too much about the time of year. Um, so here's the graph of protein change and black locust. Definitely a correlation there. Not a super strong. I mean, usually 0 0.80 in terms of the R squared value is like when we start to really see strong trends. So it's it's higher than a lot of the stuff I analyze, but it's still it's it's in the you know 50 to 70 percentile. So it's not terrible, but it's there. But again, if you look at this and think about it, well, look at the beginning of June. I mean, this is a 30% protein composition. <laughs> and at the end of the year, when it's the lowest, it's still around 18 or 20%. So it's not bad. It's still a very high protein forage, even at the lowest time of the year. And actually, if anything, the high protein content in the beginning of the season would might want to um, lend us some caution in feeding it because this uh, excessive protein to animals transitioning from hay to pasture can lead to, to problems like bloat. So the, the takeaway is a lot of these uh, woody plants are pretty hyper accumulated in some of these compounds and nutrients and measures. And from a management perspective, we're probably only going to feed them in bits and pieces a bit. So it's a good supplement. Um, but just we should be aware of when we're feeding them and some of the, the, the potential um, questions or consequences of that, right? So, um, uh, yeah, uh, that's all I have to say that. So buckthorn, here's an example, change in potassium, kind of flat, pretty much flat. So meaning if you were uh, seeking, potassium is a really important uh, macronutrient and something that um, a lot of grazing diets need more of. Um, sometimes it's deficient in our other forages. Um, buckthorn is a really great source of potassium and it's, it's there when you want it. <laughs> it doesn't matter what time of the season. Um, if you're looking at these graphs, just so you know, the bars are representing the measurements we took in 2019 and the little faded red line is showing the points in 2020 because the dates didn't line up. So we're kind of um, showing both at the same time. And then the dark two lines are showing the, the trend analysis. And then finally, just one more example, change in zinc. Um, not a super strong correlation, especially in 2020. Um, kind of data points all over the place, so to speak, not, not strong, but uh, you can see somewhat of a trend towards more accumulation of zinc, um, especially in the later part of the year. And I think this is because willow starts to drop its leaves really early and probably the zinc is left behind. And so there's less of the other things and more zinc showing up. And so again, 
most an grazing animals have enough zinc. Um, there's, there's, there's no concern. Uh, the threshold for sheep is 750 parts per million in their diet. And the highest we saw in here was 300 parts per million or a little above that, I guess, maybe 350. So it's not going to be overly too much, but it is exceptionally high when you compare it to other forages. And so it is a great source of zinc and probably doesn't matter when you feed it necessarily, but if you had a reason to target zinc, you might want to think about towards the end of the season. So basically to summarize um, this two years of research and, and learning from it, um, one thing I wanna point out is uh, in our tree fodder seminar, we talked with Ashley Conway, who's at the University of Missouri and has done a lot more with um, ruminant nutrition than I, I have. And I learned a lot talking with her and working to prepare her, um, her presentation. I really recommend watching that one if you're interested in the, the dynamics of nutrition and understanding that more. But um, it's really dangerous to extrapolate and say, well, this data then shows that this is what's gonna be on, on my site because it's really variable. Um, there's databases of of uh, nutritional values for a lot of tree fodders. There's a great one I've linked on the website. Um, it's actually based in Denmark and it's a lot of European uh, based research. It gives you some sense, but don't take it at face value. Like this is the amount of protein I will get, or this is the amount of something else. It's, it's something that's very site specific and season specific. And if you really wanted to dig in and do this on your own farm, uh, what you would need to do is actually do your own forage analysis. Um, the good news is that what we learned from some of the, the trend work we did is I don't think you would need to sample at such an intensive rate in order to learn a lot. Like a sample maybe at the early part and the end of the season or even early, middle and end would be sufficient to get a, a decent profile of what's what's in your in your your tree forage um, and get a, a snapshot of what that looks like. I think I, that's pretty safe to say from from what we saw. Um, Thinking of tree fodders as a valuable supplement and an emergency food supply, you know, so last year we barely fed any tree fodder. It was a very wet year and there was not an issue with grass <laughs> and legumes. There were, it was an issue to keep up with them, we'll say. Um, but we're holding off. So we didn't feed tree fodder last year, but all of that growth is now in storage and going to only amplify next year um, for the next time it's dry and we don't have that grass. And that's really where I see the key for the, the farm resiliency is we can manage these trees have that stuff ready for, for those times. And it's not only gonna just like keep our animals alive, but actually keep them very healthy at the same time. Um, we found that all the tree fodders had a relative good feed value, ADF, NDF. They have, uh, they're rich in macro and micronutrients. They're all a bit different. Um, and, and there's not one that's better or worse. Um, I was pleased to see that, like I said, the, the so-called invasives have value because I think that hopefully gets people thinking, scratching their heads a bit and saying, how do I, how do I perceive these plants and what's the role in management of them? Um, the minerals uh, are concentrated more in others, uh, some, some plants than others, and they flux a lot during the season. There's not like trends or timing, at least from this data that um, show it. I think if you, if you feed it, they're going to get a dose of it at a good amount, um, broadly speaking. <laughs> um, and that's good. And if, again, visiting sort of Fred Provenza's work and this kind of concept of animal bodily wisdom, if, you're, if your livestock have experienced foraging the landscape and they're introduced to these things, not as the sole thing they eat, like don't just feed them willow, but give them a little access to willow along with 10 other things. And a lot of these animals can self-regulate and find the balance. And, and what we see when we observe animals in our pasture is that they... They all need something different. And that's what Fred Provenza's research showed. It's not like every sheep needs the exact same combination of this amount of um, clover and this amount of willow and this amount of grass. It's, it's everyone's balancing their own diet. Just like I need a little bit of a different uh, dinner than you probably do tonight, you know, something like that. So, so this information coupled with good understanding of animal behavior, I think is a really important um, thing to consider. And I'll just add as a last caveat, I didn't find any um, overlap between the numbers we found and like a, a concern with toxicity. Like I said, with the zinc, I looked it up, didn't find any concerns with those really high numbers and like coming really anywhere close to the toxic levels that were listed in the research. But just be aware that these things are sort of hyper <laughs> in some nutrient capacity. And so it could be of concern. And so it's a good take home to say, if you want to be utilizing something as a substantial part of an animal's diet, that you'd want to do that analysis and have a, a bigger understanding of what that, what that potentially looks like. And that is my, 
presentation. So um, I want to thank Northeast SARE, the Farmer Grant Program. Like I mentioned, the, the number of the grant is FNE19930. If you go to silvafasterbook.com and click on Tree Fodder, you'll find the link to the grant report there. If you go today, it will not be updated. It'll be from last year. But again, I, uh, my final report is due at the end of the month. And so I expect in early February, it'll be available if you want to dig into all the, all the details, um, as well as just keep in mind the other tree fodder seminars and other things we have as we continue this conversation. And, and my invitation to folks is, is to um, hopefully see tree fodder as a, as a valuable component. It is not intended to replace our good grazing of grasses and legumes and, and, and forbs out in the landscape, but certainly a really powerful uh, supplement, both nutritionally and definitely from a carbon um, uh and, and a climate resiliency standpoint. So um, we need everybody on deck to who's grazing, who's working with animals and excited about trees to, to try some of the stuff and to share out because we have a lot to learn um, in this part of the world of what it looks like um, into the future. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy to um, chat and answer any questions. Thanks so much, Steve. That was so much fun to listen to. Um, it looks like we have one question in the chat now, and it, um, we've got a question. Uh, when you say the willow is chipped and used as an energy source, was it burned or was it used as mulch? What was it used for? Yeah, so that um, experiment was using, uh, and I'm not fully up on the, all the technology, but it was a gasified technology. The wood chips were essentially put into a boiler and then used as both a heat source and generated electricity on the farm. And this was on Prince Edward Island again in Canada. And so there was a lot of um, focus on that. And it was actually really cool to see the unit because it was quite farm scale. It was a nice size, um, but they were, it was a decent sized potato farm, which um, the systems there have a lot of fertilizer runoff, which is why the government was supporting this research in the willow buffers. But um, they were actually, they were pretty much offsetting 100% of their electricity use with this biomass, which was pretty cool. So it was chipped and then used, used in a gasification type system, I believe is what it's called. Hi, Steve, this is Mary Rose. Hey, Mary Rose. Asking a verbal Oops. question. I don't. Okay, and pardon me if you address this because I had somebody come to the house, but I, I really hear what you're saying about not wanting to cast aspersions on plants by calling them invasive, but give me your two bits about multiflora rose. <laughs> Fair enough. That's a good one. <laughs> That's the one plant that um, I, I, I struggle in my relationship to because it's like the one that snags you on every time you're walking through it, right? And like, even after you've cut it down, it like seems to... <laughs> It seems to get you. Um, <laughs> I, I would say um, our sheep d will not preferentially browse it, but very, very daintily nibble at it. They don't do a good job at vegetation control. I think I've seen some goats do amazing work with it. Um, I think that uh, it's a hard one because it does not have, even, even if an animal wanted to strip it clean of all the leaves, it doesn't actually have that much mass or material. So I think from a fodder perspective, um, it's it's not a big player. I think I learned from working with youth that the the rose hips that we would make tea out of in the woods have you know it, it always has a place in the landscape, right? But um, it's certainly one that we I will say we do pursue eradication on our farm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I still appreciate it as a plant, but it, it gets me all the time, and it's just not it, it snags too much fence. Yeah, an animal and me. So yeah. <laughs> All right, we have another question in the chat. Um, after grazing hedges or plantings, are you doing cleanup of plants to cut back woody stems left when they are just eating the leaves and plant tips? So, so far not. Um, there's so many questions about management post grazing and what's best. Um, and I think it's right now just a time and energy thing where we don't do it and we don't see these plants suffering because of it, if that makes sense. What I do, what I would suggest is, um, I do think there's power with like the willow, for example, in cutting it back to the ground every five to seven years and getting that vigorous regrowth. Um, 
because it what it tends to do is harden off the trunk and um, it's you can feel it and that's the thing is you interact with your animals and landscape and you understand why they wouldn't want to strip that bark and that's a good thing so sometimes you're managing because you want thick bark so that they don't strip it sometimes with the willow we're like it's fine if they strip the whole thing because it's all green and supple so um my my approach has been hands off and see what happens and a lot of these vigorous plants um it's great because you can you don't have to worry too much about them being killed. like like buckthorn's a great example you you there's brett brett and, and some other folks in the forest who work at cornell have tried to like eradicate buckthorn it's almost impossible to eradicate even with like really heavy duty pesticides like it's a very persistent plant and so the good news with that is you can try all sorts of management from a fodder perspective and you're not going to kill it <laughs> and you're probably going to learn something so um we have not so to answer your question directly we have not done any like follow-up or really like pruning things intensively but that's mostly just because of time and energy and we're kind of curious to see how it responds and for the most part i think it it's responding just fine i don't have any answers for like how long one should wait before there's there's more exposure um and i think that depends a lot on on what the animals have access to so the pollard is really nice because the concept of that is cutting things above browse height which means the animals are only going to get access if you go in there and clip stuff off something that you cut to the ground they're going to have access to more of it what we found with our willow is we make sure there's at least 50 percent of the vegetation above browse height that they can't get to so that the plant still has plenty of leaf material to photosynthesize and recover and they're just eating the bottom stuff and again the tans and the willow kind of naturally inhibit their eating and then they move on to a new space um where you run into problems with trees and woody plants and overgrazing and issues is generally when you have the animals with the trees for too long which they will do an impressive job at stripping the heck out of it and destroying the thing if you leave them in there too long and and sometimes too long is like an hour too long and that's where your grazing system comes in we've had some poplar rows in the you know we thought ah they probably have enough forage we don't need to move them tonight we'll move them in the morning and then we like here over over the course of the night they're like ganging up on the poplar and pushing it over and stripping and eating it because they're just they're just tired of everything else so <laughs> so that's the biggest impact is i would say set your system up so you can move the animals before or when you see that kind of activity um, especially on younger trees and things like that once they're established I, I have a lot less concern with with excessive damage so we have another question um how many paddocks worth of fence do you have or how many paddocks could you set up at one time with the fence you have yeah that's such a great question when we started we had one paddocks worth and there was always this dance of like cutting the sheep off and putting them in this little paddock, freeing up the fence, moving the fence, and then trying to, you know, shuffle them. And over time we have um, at least three. And I'm every year I'm like, I just wish I had a couple more fences. I could do four paddocks. Cause I feel like um, the more the merrier, right? So it's kind of a balance between what you want to spend on fence and, and that, but I would recommend at least two or three paddocks worth ahead of time. So like on our farm on Monday, we set up three or four days worth of paddock, which means that we can, go through our week and the realities of life and move the animals exactly when they need it and not when we have time to move the fence. Um, and I think that's that's definitely worth it um, to invest in in double or triple the amount so that you're you're able to respond to that. The other another question is how much living fence do you have? Very little. <laughs> we have that nice little demonstration willow that's about <laughs> I think it's about 70 feet maybe. Um, We've done some others around the perimeter. We didn't have a lot of existing vegetation that was thick enough to lay it. Um, there is a process called dead hedging, which I'm interested in, which is basically setting yourself up with stakes in the same way that we wove that living fence, but then piling dead material in. So basically making a living fence, but using brush, which you have. Um, so we'd like to expand, but we don't have a lot right now. It's really more, it was really more of an experiment and um, I'm fully convinced, but it always comes back to the time and the labor. So um, we had probably 12 people in that class make that fence in a few hours, <laughs> but like one of us doing it, it would take weeks and weeks and weeks that we do not have. So those, it's one of those things that it exists in an ancestral time when also like human labor on land was very abundant. And that's probably like <laughs> what we need in order to, to have it more um, widespread, but um, we don't have a lot. So maybe more in the future, we'll see. So I think Jess, what you're saying is your question did get answered there, that second question. Um, 
Cool. Um, we do have two minutes left. Um, folks want to ask more questions. I just well, I, I have a question. Oh, you're, go ahead, Mary Rose. Sorry, your presentation is so great, and I just so appreciate all the information. And I love the Silvo Pasture book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she was not paid by that for that promotion either. <laughs> um, no, I really appreciate it. And it's been uh, such a great uh, process. The Sarah Farmer grant it gives you the space to. Uh, I would encourage anyone who's thinking of applying to think about like what is something I would research if I had money to support the materials I need and money to support the time it takes to do the extra work because there's no way on my own spare time as much as I'm interested in this stuff I would like collect a bunch of data take it up to dairy one take the samples up to dairy one like process it I'll do it but but the grant supports you to do that and I think that's a really important valuable role it plays um and so if you have a question like that that you're like god if I just had the time and a little support I could answer it it's such a great program for that so that's what I'm excited about because um there's no way we would know this stuff without without that kind of that kind of framing. So I, I'm glad to glad to share it, and I hope there's more because I really want to um, see this become a really common, not an obscure, <laughs> but a common practice on on grazing landscapes. So, well, I I, I want to ask one question. Um, yeah. Maybe other folks will have some, but I know it's also five fifteen. Um, are you do you have a lot of deer pressure in your forest, and does this practice kind of offer you the opportunity to like have more resilience to that or does it maybe help prevent that in some way I'm just curious if there's if this is potentially a solution to deer pressure for folks this being the fodder itself or well yeah I mean just like the agroforestry the like the agroforestry work that you're doing with grazing animals in your in your forest so I don't think it'll solve it. It actually creates better deer habitat. Like they want the same thing. They want like open forests with forage in the understory. That's definitely true. Um, I think there's a question of like getting trees established and deer pressure, right? Because that's a challenge and that's a big hang up for a lot of folks who want to plant trees. And we're um, actively interested in um, trying to research different methods for, for establishing trees so that deer don't attack them. <laughs> um, so that's like a one layer. Um, but I know I think I mean deer deer is so interesting so like around here in the Finger Lakes the deer density is highly diverse and it really depends on where you're at and um, we have we have some but not as bad as some places where you know you put something in the ground the next day it's eaten it's completely gone. Um, so I think that for us the deer strategy has been um, has been multifaceted in terms of uh, first learning their habitat and their behavior. Uh, patterns. So they definitely move through our landscape through a corridor that kind of skirts the edge of our farm. And so they have not affected a lot of our tree planting that's kind of in, in, in outside of that, too far outside of that, especially if they have to go across a lot of open field and there's dogs and there's kind of all the farm infrastructure. So we've had less deer damage on the interior, but on the edges, we have to really pay attention where they might be passing through. So one is to learn the, because you have deer on your landscape that are the same deer the same families they're moving through in very similar patterns you can actually learn that you just have to talk to the hunters around you if you're not doing it yourself so that's like one piece and then the other piece is thinking about a multi-tiered strategy so definitely our, our presence of our dogs the presence of some of the things we're doing on the farm the fences that we choose to put up the timing of when we plant so i i, I ideally like to plant in the spring if i can find the time only because the tree gets established and it gets a, a lot of growth on before if I plant in the fall often I'm putting a very vulnerable tree in right when the deer are also like running out of food <laughs> and so I have to do a lot more to protect it so so there's a lot of kind of relationship pieces to think about um and it all is in relation to how how dense the deer population and how intensive so I'd say we have like a moderate intensity and so we can get away with a lot more um if deer pressure is really high definitely planting and protecting things if you're getting them established, but then also pollarding would be your, your go-to. Um, not cutting stuff to the ground if you're worried about them browsing what you want to feed to your animals. The pollarding is, is, is a strategy for keeping your animals off it, but also for keeping the deer off of it, if that makes sense. Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, Definitely. Happy to well, share. We know we went a little over, but it looks like you left your contact information there so folks can reach out to you. Yeah, and I'll just um, last thing is I'll um, in the chat I mentioned our we have our farm farm mailing list. So if people wanted to put their name on this little Google form, we I can send out. Um, I'll see I'll see it's from the NOFA thing, and I can send out some links from the 
presentation and then you'll just get our announcements when we have more stuff coming up. We do have a, um, uh, one thing I mentioned to folks, we do have a four week class coming up with the Ecological Farming Association of Ontario at the end of the month that we're gonna do four weeks of civil pasture training online. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, that's coming up and if you wanna dig deeper. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. This yeah, is thank so you. Fun. Thank, thank you, you so much. Here. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks.